Um, thank you again, all of you, for coming here. It's a, it's a great pleasure to see you all. Uh, we set up this event uh, for two purposes. First of all, to tell you a bit about music um, and its connection to emotions, but also to tell you about our activity here at the um, at the uh, Van Leer Institute that we have been running in the past year, and we are intending to continue uh, uh, also next year, and to, um, by making it, making you aware of it, those who are really interested in the topic and, uh, uh, and want to join uh, and contribute to our, to our project um, are, are basically very much welcome and are uh, invited to send me a message uh, tell me a little bit about their interest in music, about their interest in, in this sp specific topic, and we, um, we, are, we are intending to enlarge the group. We are going to give two talks, um, and I think uh, we are going to deviate a little bit from the original program. Uh, Eric Maskin will speak first, and uh, then I will speak, and then we'll uh, 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 basically uh, do a um, a break, we'll take a break. Those who are part of the group may want to continue and discuss um, forthcoming events that we'll have next year, next academic year. Um, and others are, are uh, invited uh, uh, to, to continue discussion on a cup of coffee outside. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce you Professor Eric Maskin from Harvard University. His uh, 2007 Nobel laureates in economic made enormous contribution in economic theory. He will talk a little bit about his contribution. He's also uh, a musician. He's playing the clarinet. He has a trio. And every time he's coming uh, to Jerusalem, uh, within, uh, uh, we are both uh, organizing a summer school every year. We bring about. Um, uh, 100, more than 100 students from all over the world, PhD students, to learn about economics. We bring with them um, key researchers in each topic that we present each year. And um, every time uh, Eric is coming over uh, to direct this school, he's also giving a concert in, in Mishkenot, and he will give one uh, uh, on the 30th this month, uh, with uh, on the first, sorry, on the first this month, with uh, jointly with the trio um, of a clarinet, which is his role, um, cello and piano. Um, Eric, as I said, uh, has been a friend for many years. Uh, we worked together on the summer school. We talk a lot about uh, economics, about music, about rationality, and uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce him. Please, Eric. Thank you very much. Uh, I have to start with a confession, though. Uh, I'm here under slightly false pretenses, because uh, unlike Eyal, uh, I have never done any work on the connection uh, between music, emotions, and rationality. <laughs> so I, I'm really not qualified to talk about that, and, and I won't try to, to say very much at all. Uh, however, as Eyal said, in my professional life, as, a, as an economist, uh, I have certainly made great use of the concepts of rationality. And in my non-professional life, uh, I have devoted a lot of time to music, and I've experienced the emotional release that, that music brings. So I have familiarity with all three concepts separately, but putting them all together, um, I think, is beyond me. But if AL can certainly do that. So, so um, let me do this instead. Let me first try to 
to say something about how I use rationality uh, in my work. I, I do something that's called uh, mechanism design, that we, and that may be a term that means nothing to you. Uh, it's, it's, it's part of, of economics. In fact, I, I like to think of it as economics in reverse. Uh, most of the time, economists take existing economic situations and they try to say, what's going to happen? Uh, what, can, what can we predict this set of institutions will generate? Or we might look back on a set of events and try to explain uh, why things happened the way they did. And that's, and that's fine. That, that's what probably most economists do. But I like to, to reverse the order. That is, I like to start with the outcomes and then work backwards and figure out, are there institutions, are there mechanisms which will get us to the outcomes that we want? So it's, it's reverse engineering in, in economics. And uh, let me give you a couple of examples, and, and you'll see from these examples uh, why rationality on the part of the participants in these economic mechanisms is so important. So, so here, here's a little example, an example that probably many of you uh, are familiar with because uh, what I'm going to be describing is actually a very old mechanism. But uh, uh, imagine that you're a parent and you have a, a cake that you want to divide between your two children. Your, your two children are um, Alice and Bob. And your goal as the parents is to divide the cake in such a way that neither child envies the piece that the other kid is getting. So, so that means Alice shouldn't think that Bob's piece is bigger, and Bob shouldn't think that Alice, Alice's piece is bigger. Um, if your family is anything like mine, uh, it's a disaster <laughs> if, if one child thinks the other the other's piece is bigger. Uh, so, so your goal is to, is to seek what is called a fair division. A fair division is one where each, each child is happy with the piece that he or she has got. Well, if you know that the children see the cake the same way that you do, there's a very simple solution for achieving a fair division. You can just take a knife and cut the cake exactly in half and give each child one of the pieces. And because I'm assuming that the kids see the cake the same way you do, since you believe that you cut the cake in half, they will think so too. And that will, and that will solve the, the, the problem. The difficulty is, and again, you probably know this from your own family, Children never see things the way their parents do. Uh, so, so you might think you've cut the cake exactly in half, but Bob might think that Alice's piece is bigger. In fact, it's likely that, uh, that Bob will think that Alice's piece is bigger, and Alice at the same time might think Bob's piece is bigger. So, so the, the problem uh, that you face is you don't really have enough information to achieve a fair division on your own. You don't know how Bob and Alice view the cake, and so you can't, you can't achieve a fair division by cutting the cake yourself. So you might ask, is there some mechanism which will get you to a fair division, even though, in a sense, you don't know what a fair division is yourself? Well, uh, as I say, this is a very old problem. It, it literally goes back thousands of years. Um, and there is a very old solution, uh, an amazingly simple solution, um, which uh, goes as follows. Uh, the, the mother can have one of the children, say Bob, cut the cake in half. And the other child, Alice, gets to decide which of the two pieces she takes for herself, and then Bob gets the other. So this is called the divide and choose method. Uh, and 
Why does it work? Well, it, it works because when, when Bob is cutting the cake, he has a strong incentive to cut it in such a way that in his eyes, the two pieces are exactly equal. Why? Because if one of the pieces is bigger, he knows Alice is going to take that one, and he'll get stuck with the small piece. So, so Bob will cut the cake so that whichever piece Alice takes, Bob will be happy with the other one. So Bob will be happy, and Alice will be happy because she gets to choose her, her favorite piece. So, so we've solved the problem, despite the fact that the mother uh, had no idea what the kids would view as, as fair. So this divide and choose mechanism solves the problem. But notice that, th that there's an important invocation, an important use of rationality in this mechanism. Um, in particular, when Bob is cutting the cake, he has to anticipate, he has to understand that it is going to be in Alice's interest to, to choose the bigger piece. So he, he has to take that into account. That is rationality. And the mechanism really only works if Bob has enough rationality to properly anticipate uh, uh, what Alice is going to do. OK, so let, let me give you one more example, uh, an example on a, on a slightly bigger scale than, than cutting cakes. Um, imagine that you're uh, a government that has uh, a radio license. You own this radio license, which, which is the right to broadcast on a particular band of radio frequencies. And you want to transfer that license to one of several telecom companies uh, who, are, who are interested in, in getting that license. Well, th th this is actually a problem that many governments around the world have faced over the last 20 years. We've seen a telecom revolution thanks to the transfer on the part of government of massive parts of the radio spectrum from the public to the private sector. It used to be that the government con controlled all of this radio spectrum, and now it's in the hands of telecom companies. And that's, and that's made possible the amazing world we live in with, with, uh, with cell phones, like the one I heard a minute ago, uh, and satellite TV, and all, and all sorts of modern miracles. Uh, so. Uh, what is your goal as the government as far as uh, putting uh, this uh, license uh, in the hands of, of a telecom company? Well, you, you want the license to go to the company that values the license the most. That, that's what economists would call the efficient outcome. And the reason why it's the efficient outcome is that, that that's the company that's likely to provide the most value for society. And that's your goal as government, to, to have the right company uh, get the license. The problem is you don't know which company values it the most. So, so it's, it's similar uh, to the cake problem. There, there's a crucial lack uh, of, of information. Well, what can you do about that? that you can go around and you can ask the companies, how much do you value the license? Uh, the problem is that if a company understands that its chance of getting the license is higher, if it quotes a higher number, well, then it has a strong incentive to exaggerate and, and say, you know, the license is worth twice as much or three times as much as it actually is, because that will increase the company's chance of actually getting the license. So all the companies will be exaggerating, and the poor government will have no idea which company really does value it the most. So that, so that procedure is not likely to work very well. You might try to do something a little bit more sophisticated. You might have each company make a bid for the license. A bid is a statement how much you are willing to pay. 
and, and you could have each company make a bid and then award the license to the company that makes the highest bid um, and have that company pay its bid. That, that sounds better than the first mechanism. Uh, it is better because now companies no longer have an incentive to, to uh, exaggerate. If, if, the, if the license is worth, is worth 10 million to the company, it's not going to bid 12 million because if it did bid 12 million and won, it would be paying too much. It would be paying 12 million, it's only worth 10 million. So companies won't exaggerate. The problem is that this mechanism won't work either because now companies have the incentive to understate. So if, if it's worth 10 million to you, you're not going to bid 10 million because if you did bid 10 million and you won, you'd have a zero profit. You'd be getting something worth 10 million, but you'd be paying 10 million, so your net payoff would be zero. So that means that com all companies will be underbidding under bidding something less than it's than the true value um, and so once again there's no guarantee that the uh, high bidder will actually be the company that values it the most and so you might begin to wonder at, at this point whether there's any mechanism which will solve the problem wh whether there's a mechanism which will induce companies neither to exaggerate nor to understate. Well, um, William Vickery, an, an American economist, thought about this problem about 50 years ago, and he came up with uh, an amazingly simple solution, uh, a beautiful solution, I would maintain, and I'll come back to the, to the issue of why it's beautiful uh, at the end of the talk. Uh, what he proposed was this. It, it's, it's very similar to the mechanism that I just described. That is, uh, once again, each company makes a bid. And once again, the winner is the high bidder. But now, instead of paying its own bid, the winning bidder pays the second highest bid. So this is called the second bid or the second price mechanism. Uh, so, for example, if there were three bidders and one bid 10 million and one bid 8 million and one bid 7 million, the winner would be the company that bid 10 million because that's the high bid, but it would pay only 8 million because that's the second highest bid. So, so I claim, and, and Vickery showed, that this mechanism actually gives each company the incentive to bid exactly what the license is worth to that company. And let, let me explain why. Uh, the, the first thing to notice is that companies no longer have the incentive to understate because they don't pay their bid anyway. If it's worth 10 million to me and I bid 9 million, that's not going to reduce my payment because my payment is determined by the second highest bid, not by my own bid. So I never, get, I never gain anything from understating. And furthermore, I run the risk, if I understate, of losing the license altogether. Say, say I, I bid 7 million. It's worth 10 million to me. I bid 7 million. But somebody else has bid 8 million. Well, now I'm going to lose the license. The other company will have outbid me. And I will deeply regret uh, losing because if I had just bid 10 million, I would have won and I would have had a nice 2 million profit, 10 million minus 8 million. So underbidding is never a good idea and it can be a very bad idea. So you don't want to underbid. You also don't want to overbid because if, you, if it's worth 10 million to you and you bid 12 million, well, what if somebody else bids 11 million? You will win. You wouldn't have won had you, had you bid 10 million, what it's really worth to you. You will win by bidding 12 million, and that's true, but look what you'll have to pay. You'll have to pay 11 million, and that's too much. It's only worth 10 million. So you don't, overbidding is a very bad idea, too. You're not going to do that. The only thing left 
is to bid exactly what the license is worth to you. That's what you should do. Uh, and if every company is doing that, then indeed the winner will be the company with the highest value, despite the fact that the government had no idea when it ran this mechanism which company that was. So, so, so once again, we've solved the problem. But once again, note that we have made uh, important use of rationality. Companies have to be able to go through the sort of reasoning that I just went through with you to understand why it is in their interest to bid their true value. That, that, that requires at least some rationality. So, so rationality plays plays a, a big role um, in, in my subject in economics. I think AL will have something to say about uh, its connection uh, with music. Uh, but what, um, what I'd like to, to, to discuss a little bit uh, right now is what, is what I do for fun. So, so, so econo well, economics is a lot of fun too, but <laughs> that's my professional life and everybody needs to do something else. Uh, so what do I do uh, uh, in, my, in my spare time? Uh, it's, it's, it's mostly music these days. I, I come from a, a musical family. Uh, my mother was a concert pianist. My brother plays the oboe and the English horn in a symphony orchestra. My father uh, had intended to be a violinist. He, he, he studied the violin seriously and um, was, was hoping to have a professional career. Uh, at some point, Someone told him he wasn't going to be the next Heifetz, uh, and he was, he was such a perfectionist that he, he decided, well, maybe, maybe violin wasn't his best option. So he ended up going into medicine, but he, but he continued to play uh, violin pretty seriously. I, I was the black sheep of the family. Uh, I never really thought uh, I would end up as a professional musician, uh, and and I didn't, but uh, but I still um, studied the piano and I and later the clarinet from a, from a young age and and was encouraged to think uh, that music uh, should be a big part of my life, uh, and it always has been, and I I particularly have enjoyed playing chamber music, uh, and that's what I'm going to be doing with my trio uh, next Tuesday. We're playing a program of trios by Mozart and, and Beethoven. Uh, is, is this microphone not working? Oh, OK. Uh, well, so, <coughs> so what connects economics to music uh, in my life. Uh, well, one thing I, I would uh, one thing I would say is uh, the role that beauty plays as an aesthetic value in 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 both fields. Uh, I I don't think I have to tell you how important beauty is in in music. But you might be surprised to hear that it's beauty. Yeah, we, we uh, the the composer strives to produce be beautiful music. The musician strives can to. You, can you say what beauty is? No, uh, I can't. <laughs> I, I I'll I'll have one. I'll I'll, I'll try one. One, uh, this won't be an, a, a definition of beauty, but I, 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 I'll talk about one quality of beauty in just a minute. Um, but before I do that, I, I want to say that, uh, surprising as it may seem, beauty is also a, a, an important value in economics. Uh, and, and actually, you had um, a little uh, example of that already. There are many ways that an economist 
uh, could try to solve an economic problem, a, a difficult economic problem such as how do you figure out which of several telecom companies should get a license. Uh, and since there are so many possible mechanisms that you could consider, you need some principle for cutting down the, 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 the set of, of possibilities. And one uh, very important guiding principle is to look for beautiful solutions. Now, I don't have a clear-cut definition of what's, um, what a beautiful solution is, but I would contend to you, I, 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 would, I would argue, that the divide and choose mechanism, where one child cuts, the other chooses, and the second price mechanism, where the winning bidder is the high bidder but pays the second highest bid, uh, are beautiful mechanisms. Now, now why, are they, why are they beautiful? Uh, I think one reason, one important reason why they are beautiful is because of their simplicity and their elegance. Uh, the, uh, the telecom license problem, as I said, is, is potentially extremely complicated. Uh, it's also very important. Uh, and yet, we have an amazingly simple uh, procedure for determining which company really does have the high, highest value. It consists of just three elements. Companies make bids, the winner is the high bidder, the winning bidder pays the second highest bid. That's it, no, no complicated interaction between the companies, uh, no multiple stages, it's all over uh, very quickly. Uh, and, 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 and that's very simplicity makes uh, finding such a mechanism in the first place, so someone had to find it, um, an easier task. If, if, you, if you believe in your heart that there's going to be an easy answer, you have some chance of, of finding that answer. Uh, well, simplicity is also, I, I think, a, an important component of musical beauty. Uh, I once heard Leonard Bernstein talk about the opening phrase of Mozart Symphony Number no. Forty, which which probably most of you know. Um, that's right. Ba-da-dum, ba-da-dum, ba-da-dum. Ber Bernstein said that having established a pattern in the first half, a lesser composer than Mozart would have been tempted to follow exactly the same rhythmic pattern in the second half. So what, what a lesser composer would have done is ba-da-dum, ba-da-dum, ba-da-da-dum, ba-da-dum, 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 bum. But Mozart knew that the repetition of the last note was superfluous, inelegant, and he left it out. And, you know, it's hard to say why that simplifying uh, gesture on, on Mozart's part makes the passage more beautiful, but it clearly does. Uh, you, you can hear, if, if, if you can get past my terrible singing, you can hear that, the, that, that Mozart's version is better <laughs> than the other version. So, so, so simplification, getting rid of excess notes is an important, uh, is, is an, is an important principle in economics, just as looking for uh, simple mechanisms uh, is, is an important uh, principle in finding solutions to difficult economic problems. So despite the, their very different natures, uh, I would like to conclude that it, at least in the matter of beauty and simplicity, uh, 
economics and music turn out not to be so very different after all. Thanks very much. <laughs>
I do. In fact, uh, I thought that s some of what I was suggesting this morning is. is Well, uh, if, um, if perhaps I can encroach on what, I'm not sure what you're going to say, Al, uh, but one, one of the things that uh, we know from, uh, from, from recent work in economics and in uh, biology in, in neuroscience is that uh, the emotions, and, and, and we, we, we think of uh, music as a way of e expressing emotions. Stress, stress. Hmm? Sorry? <laughs> I, I do believe that. I do believe that. Uh, but one one thing we know from from, uh, from particularly from recent studies is that rationality and emotion are not so far away as you might think. Some, uh, traditionally, uh, rationality and emotion have been thought of as opposites and, and in conflict. Uh, they are not. In fact, you might ask the, the, the evolutionary question, why do, we, why do we have emotions? It's precisely because emotions give us a guide to making good decisions. It is emotion that gives us the guidance, guidance to make our decisions. That's right. So this is, a, this is a point, for example, that the psychologist uh, Danny Kahneman, who probably many of you uh, know or you know of his work, has made. We, d we, don't, we don't always have the time, or for that matter, the information to you know, go through a detailed calculation to, to, do, to, to make a rational decision in the full sense of the word rational. But uh, our emotions give us intuitions, give us direction, give us guidance. Uh, so that even without time and even without information, we're, we're directed toward the right decision. So, so uh, that's an, another sense, I think, in which music and uh, 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 rationality and uh, emotion, music and economics are uh, much closer than they may appear to be initially. <laughs>